Thanks very much for coming out on a, on a Wednesday afternoon to talk about owls. Um, all owls are welcome here, not just solid owls. So, so we'll, we'll talk. So a lot of our research that happens at North Branch Nature Center is specific to this, this little solid owl. It doesn't look so little on a screen like that. Um, can we uh, uh, knock the lights off, please? Knock them off. Knock them out. <laughs> OK, there we go. Ah, yes. <laughs> It makes sense to talk about owls in the dark, doesn't it? Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to pass around a couple things before we get going. And I'm going to encourage these, um, these are owl wings, and I'm going to encourage these to go around a couple of times. Um, one, the first time when you, when you uh, see them, um, just you know, admire them, their, their camouflage and their coloration, their, their weight, their size. This, these, are, these wings are from a, a barred owl. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the adaptations that owls have to be able to do what they do, to be able to, to be such effective predators. And, um, and some of those adaptations have to do with their wings. Um, and so when the wing makes it back around to you, I look a little bit more closely, OK? So I'll start one right here. And I'll start one in the back. No, no need to see both. They're both the same. One's left and one's right. <laughs> oh, and actually, I'll pass around one other thing, too. Oh, this will be fun. I'm going to pass around another wing um, that is not an owl, um, but looks like an owl. And so your job is to figure out, when the wing comes to you on this side, to figure out whether or not you're holding the owl wing or the other wing. So a little bit of a mystery. And one more thing I'll start on this side is, um, is the talons of a, I know I said I'd stand over there, but now here I am over here. Um, so uh, this is a talon of a barred owl, so you can get a sense of just how sharp they are. And so feel the, feel the, the tips carefully. And you'll also be able to feel that the, the, uh, the edge of the talons as well are beveled to a sharp edge as well, almost like, not just like a, uh, a spear, but like a knife edge. So. So now that you have things to play with, I'll start talking. So uh, yeah, my name is Sean. I'm from the North Branch Nature Center. It's really lovely that I recognize many of you from over there. And so it's nice to, to see you in another context just down the road. Um, so so uh, my, my goal tonight, or today, or I can't tell if it's day or night anymore. Um, but, but our goal is to, is to chat about owls and use the Sawat owl as kind of a window into the behavior and ecology of really all the owls that we have, or at least most of the owls that we have here in Vermont. Um, because we do have a lot of different kinds of, of owls here um, in Vermont. We have a, a great diversity. Um, and we'll talk about some of them. Some of them we will just kind of skip over because the odds of actually seeing one is very, very slim. So. Things like uh, this guy up here. Has anybody seen one of these? This is a northern hawk owl. No. I see a couple hands going up. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. How long ago was it? About 10 years. years. There's one perched right across from uh, Green Mountain Club headquarters. Mm. Oh, in, uh, in Waterbury? Yeah. Yeah, OK. A uh -huh. And, and uh, Ruth, where did you Four see yours? Five years ago, and it was along the river. Here? Middlesex. Oh, in Middlesex. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, so this this owl is. Um, we have we have owls that spend their whole life here, and right here in Vermont. We have others that that come from very far away, and when they come here, it's like being kissed by the Arctic tundra or something like that. Um, and and the northern hawk owl is probably an example of that, where it's this ghost from the north that shows up in Vermont maybe once every five years. It'll show up and perch in a tree for three weeks out side of Green Mountain Club or on a random back road in Eden, which is where I saw one about 12 years ago. Um, and then we have snowy owls. Who's seen a snowy owl before? Yeah, congratulations. Um, and different habitat for snowy owls. Who's seen a snowy owl over at the Berlin Airport? Uh, how about over in Addison County? 
So our snowy owls are another species that uh, come from um, up north. Up, they nest on the ground up in the Arctic tundra, and they spend their winters down here in the tropics of northern Vermont. And, um, and they're coming south looking for prey, looking for mice and, and voles that are um, up on top of the surface of the snow. But a lot of our other owls are a little bit more familiar to us. So raise your hand if you've seen one of these. Yeah. This is a barred owl. Now, for those of you that are, that are less familiar with species identification of, of owls, I thought we'd start tonight, before we get into the sawwet owl stuff, just start with like the basic, you, there's really two owls you gotta know. And, um, and if, you're, if you're trying to learn your owls of Vermont, you really only need two. Um, because once you've learned these two, then you can decide whatever you're, what, what, if the owl you're looking at is, is one of them or not. And if it's not, then it's something really exciting. Well, they're all exciting. All owls are lovely. Um, but most of the owls that we see are one of two kinds. And if you're looking at something that's not one of those two kinds, um, then, uh, then you have something particularly rare on your hands. So the first one is, is a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. So um, this is kind of the, the standard forest owl that we have in Vermont. And we find them in the woods. We find them at the edge of the woods. Where else do we often find them this time of year? Bird feeders. Ah, hanging out near bird feeders? Sure, sure. Uh, where else? I see them a lot on power lines um, along forested roads. Um, and especially, maybe not so much this year, but last year especially was a, was a year that we saw a lot of barred owls. Not necessarily because there were a lot more barred owls, but because they were more visible to us. They were in places that we encountered them more. I think, what, remember last year's snowpack was incredibly deep um, for, for much of, for really the whole winter. The snow never melted from November all the way through, what, I don't know, July? <laughs> um, <laughs> Over at the Nature Center, I remember in early November, there was a light snow, and we had all sorts of stuff out in the grass that we intended to pick up and put away. And we thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just yeah. once the snow melts, we'll go and get that stuff. Well, six months later, we <laughs> were able to finally get that stuff. Um, anyway, that deep snowpack uh, is, makes it difficult for owls, which hunt rodents, to be able to find their prey. And so these barred owls were coming to areas where they had a better chance at, at things than in their preferred habitat in the middle of the woods. So instead of seeing them in a habitat like this, we would see them next to our bird feeders going after birds or, or squirrels. And um, we'd see them along uh, road cuts. Um, we'll see them along uh, road cuts, sitting on power lines, hoping that rodents are running across the road and they can go down and get them where there's areas where there's no snow. So no ears, no ears on this one, dark black, eyes that look like black holes staring through your soul. <laughs> Beautiful barring pattern, that's why it's called barred owl, on the wings and uh, on the tail. And you'll see that if you actually look at the wings that I'm passing around. And um, I'm going to play the important part, since we, it's more often that we hear owls than we see them, right? I'm going to play you the song of the barred owl um, so that we can get on the same page about about what our two, two best friend owls sound like. So barred owls, really common. You find them all over the place. Uh, this map here is um, a map of the most recent breeding bird atlas of Vermont. And, uh, and this basically means that almost anywhere anybody looked for breeding barred owls, they found them. Um, and, uh, and their range extends from you know, pretty much all across the eastern seaboard from Florida all the way up. So um, pretty big distribution. Barred owl. Now how about our great horned owl? This is our other um, uh, owl friend that we encounter quite a bit. And we know, we know great horned owls. We often see more uh, plastic great horned owls on the, on the top of a roof than we see real ones. Um, but, but, you know, they make these into plastic because those are the, that's, when you, when you, if you ask a four-year-old to draw an owl, they will draw a great horned owl, right? They have that big, obvious facial, orange facial disc. They have big, huge ears like this, right? Um, no confusing that with a barred owl when you see it. If, if, you, if you're lucky enough to actually see it in, in, the, in the flesh or in the feathers, right? Um, but let's listen to what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so remember who cooks for you, who cooks for you all is the barred owl. So there's no cooking in that, right? It's, it's, it's very different. If an owl is, is saying hoot, 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 it's a great horned owl. If it's talking about cooking, it's, it's a barred owl, right? Um, so also, you'll, you heard in that recording that there's two different pitches, right? What was going on there? There's a call and response. It was a duet of a male and a female. Now, in owls, like almost all birds of prey, one um, member of the pair is much bigger than the other. Which one's bigger, male or female? The female is bigger. So which is the lower call? It's a, it's a trick question. Yeah, it's actually the male It has the lower call, even though it's quite a bit smaller, um, which was surprised me when I learned that, because I always thought the, the larger owl made the deeper sound. It would only stand to reason. But anyway, it's a, it's a uh, so you hear them duetting in the woods frequently. The barred owls, who are talking about cooking, they'll do the same duets where one will be higher, one will be a little bit lower. So anyway, so those, that's like if you, it's kind of like if you're trying to learn gulls, all you need to do is learn ring-billed gull and herring gull. Those are the only gulls you need to learn because if, if you know those gulls, then you immediately know when you, when you found something different, right? Same thing with owls. If you know barred owl and you know great horned owl, then you can be confident that you'll be able to tell when you found something that's not that. <laughs> Oh, that's not one, right? <laughs> Is that a barred owl or a great horned owl? <clears throat> so this is perhaps the cutest little bloodthirsty predator um, that, that's out there in the woods. And this is a northern sawwit owl. It's life-sized. Um, now, they're, it's about the size of a soda can. Actually, you could fit comfortably in a soda can. <clears throat> and if I put one upside down in this cup here, it would be able to turn itself around and fly out in this wow. cup. So they're small. And this is a species that we spent a lot of time at North Branch Nature Center studying. Has anybody been to our Sawin Owl Banding Program? Oh, that warms my heart. If you haven't, I invite you to join us um, uh, some night in October when we're um, banding these little Sawa owls and, uh, and teaching folks about what's going on with our research there. Um, now, we talk about great horned owls, we talked about barred owls, although those are the two owls that we see the most of, this may be very well the most common predator of any kind in our forest. Who's seen one? In the wild, in the wild, not at the nature center. So we got couple hands just went down there. Yeah, so like five or six or something like that. Um, and congratulations if you have. I've been studying sawwet owls for 11 years, and I've never seen one in the wild that I hadn't gone to try to catch. Um, so um, so they're, they're rare to see, but they're very common. Um, last year, during the migration season in the month of, of October, at North Branch Nature Center, we caught something like 160 of them um, over the course of maybe banding on 15 or 20 nights. And let's hear what our solid owl, our fierce little solid owl sounds like. <laughs> it's the, the sound of a mouse's nightmares right there. Right? Um, so if you hear the sound of a truck backing up in the woods, you're listening to a solid owl. And, and, and I've been confused. In, in a delirious state, I've been standing in like downtown Montpelier listening to like the walk signal turn on, going beep, yeah. beep, and thinking, oh, there's a solid owl around here somewhere. Um, so it sounds very mechanical, right? 
Um, but now that you know what that sounds like, be in, you know, if you're out and about at night in the woods, um, keep an ear out for that. <clears throat> it almost sounds uh, like an insect, like a cricket or something like that. But if it's in the fall, um, it's likely, or actually I should say, if it's in the fall, it's probably the nature center uh, broadcasting that from the woods. If it's in the spring during the, migra uh, during the mating season, so like March, April, somewhere like that, um, it's, it's, you, you've found one. Sawa owls are pretty darn widespread, right? Um, this kind of uh, lighter purple color up top is uh, their, their uh, year-round range. And then they kind of migrate farther south, ending up down here in this bluer colored stuff. This map isn't very accurate, um, but it gives kind of the gist of where you find these owls. <clears throat> and so I've spent time uh, catching Sawa owls at the Nature Center down in, and then down in New Paltz, New York and also over here in outside of Boise, Idaho, too. <coughs> so on the left is our sawwet owl, adult, and on the right is a juvenile sawwet owl. So if you're ever lucky enough to see a sawwet owl and it happens to look like this and not like the one on the left, then you're, you're, um, you should go buy a lottery ticket because you're very lucky that day. Um, because you found a juvenile owl, and if, if it's in those colors, it means that it nested nearby. Because by the time they get to us at the Nature Center in the fall, all the juveniles have already um, molted into their, um, their adult kind of feather patterns. So, so we never catch any owls that look like this juvenile, um, but they do have a nice look to them, don't they? Now, a um, little uh, public service announcement that's true for pretty much any bird. But it's, I hear this a lot with these little owls because people see a solid owl and they think, oh, that's a baby owl, right? It's tiny, so therefore it must be baby. Um, but in fact, you know, the adult solid owl is soda can size. Well, as soon as the juvenile is you know, on its own, um, it is also adult sized, right? Um, when birds leave the nest and they are no longer in the care of their parents, they are full size. They're the same size as their parents. In fact, with predators, um, they're often larger than their parents when, they, when their parents have sent them off on their own. Because uh, imagine you are like two months old and uh, suddenly you have to make a living by diving out of the sky and grabbing a mouse um, with your eyes closed, right? Um, that's hard work. And it takes a lot of practice to be able to do that. And, and juvenile owls or hawks or any predator are not very good at hunting when, when it's their first try at it. And so parents will often make sure that they've provided enough food to the young to fatten them up so they have a little bit of credit to burn um, as they practice, right? Why are their eyes closed? Oh, well, their eyes aren't closed. But if we were trying to do this in the dark, we wouldn't be able to see. Because truly, they're hunting with their ears more so than with their eyes. <clears throat> so um, I don't know what happened to the body of this one. <clears throat> this is uh, So these solid owls are cavity nesters. Uh, this looks like a, like a fir tree or something like that. Um, but they're, they're cavity nesters. And all they need to be happy in life is a cavity to nest in in a closed-in forest somewhere. And um, well, so here's a picture of a juvenile owl on the left inside the, the, the cavity. And on the right, this is, you know, a, this is inside of a nest box here. Um, but this is kind of what you could expect to see inside uh, of that cavity. You know, lays somewhere between five and heard up to like 10 eggs per, per litter. And you can see some mouse tails over here, things that have been pulled, back, you know, brought back in. And some tail feathers. How large is that hole in the tree? Um, if you flip a soda can on its end, um, yeah, it's like the, the diameter of a soda can, something like that. Um, yeah, I think we use like three and a half or four inch, yeah, maybe three and a half, two and a half? Maybe three or so inch um, holes in our nest boxes when we build nest boxes for this owl. <coughs> So the great, so remember how that map of the distribution of this little guy is all across the country. And that means that it's a generalist. It can, it can handle a lot of different types of forests and conditions. Um, really, it's happy in a hardwood forest, 
like you know, up here in Richmond, say, but it's also just as happy up in the Rocky Mountains in the middle of a you know a spruce and fir forest. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the forest type is, as long as there's tree cavities for it to nest in, um, and as long as it has a food source. So um, this is actually a little mouse, but in but truly their their diet is um, is the red-backed vole. All right, um, and you can see how this owl is just. Gosh, perfectly, perfectly built to do exactly this, right? Um, now let's look at the range map with the red-backed vole, right? Um, and you'll see that the range of the solid owls year-round, the, the year-round range of the solid owl very closely mimics where you find uh, red-backed voles. Um, and that's, that's no accident, really. They are pretty much specialists on this red-backed vole because red-backed voles are the type of vole that is common in interior forests. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the adaptations that these owls have for being able to do what they do and catch voles. <clears throat> so this picture I, I selected because it has this really great facial disc like this. And that, that's what we call this, this um, edging of feathers around, around the eyes and the face of an owl. And, and this facial disc here, what's that for? I heard camouflage, and, and, and that may, there may be some camouflage in, involved in it, and certainly its whole coloration is, is to be cryptic, but I, I saw some, some good gestures. Yeah, reflecting the sound, right? So that facial disc is like a, like a radar. It's like a satellite dish that, that can trap sound as it's coming. <clears throat> and if we were to look behind, let's see if the slide is in order here. If we look behind the, that facial disc, well, we'll get there in it. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. If we, if we look behind the facial disc, this is looking um, sideways at an owl. There's the beak. There's the eye. Uh, that's the back of the head. So this is the facial disc that's kind of peeled like this. And that's the ear canal of the Sawat owl. You can see how, imagine if your ear went from like the bottom of your jaw all the way up to like nearly the top of your head, <clears throat> right? That's what we're talking with the Sawat owl, with, with owls in general. Really big opening for the ear canal. And this is, you know, this, you can see how big those ear canals are in relation to the size of the skull as well. Now this picture here, this of an, of an owl skull, is something that should give you pause. So when was the last time you saw a skull that was asymmetrical? See how this part juts out down here and this part has a big bulb up here, right? So what we're looking at is, um, kind of the bone structure around those ear canals. And what it's showing is that the ears are not symmetrical. One is set higher than the other. And one is also set farther forward than the other. <clears throat> right? You can actually kind of make that out on, on the top down yeah. here. That one's a little farther back than this one. So um, if we are trying to catch a catch dinner that we're chasing after as a human. So maybe let's say we're opening the fridge and there's a sandwich in there. For us to be able to successfully put our hand on that sandwich, there, we have two eyes that are able to triangulate the position of that sandwich in the fridge so that we know exactly how, how far away it is so that when we reach to it, we can grab the sandwich rather than reaching past it or, or right? So like that, that, our binocular vision gives us that depth perception, right? Well, this is like binocular hearing, where if, you, if your ears are set asymmetrically, three-dimensionally asymmetrically, then sound is hitting one ear slightly before it's hitting the other, and the owl's brain can determine exactly where in three-dimensional space that sound is coming from, right? Like, if I were to ask you to close your eyes and I had, you know, I snap my fingers from different places in the room, you might be able to tell generally where the sound was coming from, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to pinpoint you know, exactly in this room, right where that sound was coming from. But an owl can, to the extent that it can hunt these voles um, in total darkness, even without having any sight available to it. Under the snow. <clears throat> and under the snow, thanks, yeah. So, so these little solid owls don't do, are, have a hard time punk, um, uh, breaking through the snow layer. They will do it if the snow is not very deep, but you think about like a, a barred owl, or a great gray owl, uh, or a snowy owl. Um, as they're hunting, you know, they're not able to see their prey. They're hunting it under, under, under snow. 
And I've, I've heard from um, some friends at the Raptor Research uh, Facility out in, in Wyoming that uh, you know, the, the statistic that they always like to share is that a great gray owl that is sitting over there by the door that we came in at can hear your heart beating inside your chest from over there. Um, and so, you know, compared to that, it, it's, it's nothing to be able to find a mouse moving around under snow making all sorts of noise under there, right? So, now let's revisit those wings. So, um, this is looking at the leading edge of the, the first flight feather of the owl. So, in other words, we're looking along this edge right here of that feather, or maybe this feather right here. <clears throat> um, so as we pass those wings around, take a look at that leading edge of, of the feather. And I don't know if anybody saw, but it has this little serration here. And if you look at the other wing, which is actually a turkey wing, you'll see it doesn't have that at all. What's the point of this serration along the leading edge of the flight feathers? Quiet. That's a baffle, right. It's, it's <clears throat> excuse me. It's to dampen the sound, right? So if you imagine a jet flying past you, um, or like a raven or a crow flying by you, right? You know, they, you know, when a, when a crow flies past you close, it makes a big racket. It goes shoo, as it's flying by because air is ripping across the, the, the contact at that leading edge of the wing, right? As air is getting separated and some of it's flowing over and under that airfoil. <clears throat> On owls, there's that, this, serration here that dampens that sound. It creates, it, it uh, disturbs that and so it doesn't kind of create this loud sound when, when the air breaks and goes on either side. It has the disadvantage of slowing down the owl so it can't fly very fast, <clears throat> but it can fly completely silently. When we do uh, owl surveys, uh, we go out into the woods and we, we play we're trying to figure out what owls are in the area. We'll play a series of calls. We'll play a saw what owl call. Then we'll play a screech owl. Then we'll play a long-eared owl. Then a short-eared owl. Then a barred owl. Then a great horned owl. Why, am I, why do we play them in that order and not the other? <coughs> so um, so the, those owls go from smallest to largest, <coughs> right? If we started with the great horned owl and worked our way down, then it would scare away everything smaller than it, right? Because one of the major predators of a solid owl is a barred owl. And a good predator of a long-eared owl is a great horned owl. Um, so anyway, we start small and work our way up when we're doing the survey so we don't scare away whatever we're listening for. Um, and also, if we play a solid owl song, it sometimes has the ben added benefit of attracting whatever might eat it, right? <clears throat> Uh, oh, yeah, so um, the reason I bring that up is when we're doing these owl surveys, we play a call for 30 seconds or a minute, and then we just stand there to see if an owl comes in. And so many times we'll say, ah, yeah, well, nothing came in, we'll turn around to leave, and there'll be an owl sitting right here next to us that flew in without us even noticing um, because they come in so silently. So this is a little bit about what we do over at the Nature Center. And I won't get into this too, too much because you can come and see it for real um, if you join us in October. <clears throat> but we, we uh, set up these nets out in the woods. And uh, the sawwood owls are migratory. All right? Unlike the barred owls and great horned owls, sawwood owls um, migrate through Vermont. Some of them nest here sporadically. But generally speaking, most of the sawwood owls that, that wind up in Vermont are just passing through in the spring or the fall as they're moving up to the boreal forests to our north to the nest, and then moving south into the central Appalachians or farther south <clears throat> to spend the winter. So recognizing that, we go out into the woods and we set up these big nets that are about as tall as this room, and they're about each one of them is about 40 feet long. And we set up a big series of these in a big triangle. And in the middle of that triangle, we play, we have a big loudspeaker that plays that that sound of the truck backing up, right? That uh, the territorial call of the saw wet. <coughs> and uh, even though it's not mating season, and these owls are not on territory, they're still intrigued by that, and they come in to check it out, and they get caught in the net. And the nets are specially designed for this, so that the owls fly in and safely get caught and held in, in place. And so we uh, go to the net, we take them out, we put them in. These are tomato paste cans, by the way, on the left. These are this is a little six pack of tomato paste cans, <coughs> to give you a size perspective. Oh, also, I'm, 
I, I always try to announce, um, we need your tomato paste cans. So if you're wondering what to do with tomato paste cans, um, please bring them over to the Nature Center. We would be happy to uh, have tomato paste cans donated so we can create more um, owl caddies. Um, so we um, bring them back to the, to the Nature Center. We put a little metal band on their leg uh, using some special pliers that uh, crimp around it. Each one of these bands has a unique serial number that is unique to that owl. Um, and all of the data is centralized at a particular, it's at, at the USGS bird banding laboratory, so that no owl, no bird anywhere in the world is gonna have the same band number. So if anyone else encounters the bird, they can look at the, they can report the band number, and then we'll hear about it. Uh, and other stations that I've worked at would take a little mouth swab to, to, uh, to get some, uh, some cheek tissues for a DNA analysis, and we'll use this to help figure out whether the owls are male or female. Do they try to peck you? Yes, they do try to peck you. But it's not, the, the beak isn't so much, it isn't really the, the dangerous part, right? It's the, the feet, yeah. Uh, I mean, you remember that picture of the owl coming in at the mouse. They have outsized feet for their body size, and they're nice and sharp. Um, and you can't use gloves when you're, when you're taking them out of the nets because the net is so fine that you need all the dexterity you can muster to, to remove it from, from the wings and everything. And so it takes, it takes some practice to learn how to... Um, imagine trying to give your cat a bath. <laughs> it's like that, but in the dark. Um, <laughs> But there's, as you get better at it, you, uh, you learn how to, to not get um, footed. But also, the owl, these, these owls, they'd say they spend very little time around people. They spend most of their lives in places where people aren't, you know, up, up here. Um, and so they're extremely docile for the most part. Most owls, they each, have, they each have their own little personality, but for the most part, they're all very docile when they um, end up in the net. It's almost like you approach them and they're just hanging out in this hammock. And, uh, and we've, you know, we've just slightly inconvenienced them by taking them inside for half an hour to process. So it's, it's really neat to, you know, they, they, it's very, very rare that they struggle or anything like this. So it's, it's totally safe for the, for the owls. Okay, so this, this here um, is why this banding, this banding station that we have at the Nature Center actually works. It's because there are people doing the exact same research at the exact same time all across the east, well, all across the country, but especially here across the eastern seaboard. And this is actually a pretty outdated um, image. This is back from like 2010, so there's a lot more dots on the map now. You'll see that we actually, the Nature Center, isn't done here because um, our research station started in 2013, I think. So, um, but there's at least 150 to 200 people across the country that are doing the same exact research. And the wonderful thing about these owls is they live, they live a fairly long time for a small bird, and they travel great distances, and they do it every year, um, and they follow migration corridors. And so there's actually a decent chance that an owl that you catch will be captured somewhere else um, at some point, or that you'll catch your own owl in subsequent years. So um, for my thesis work, I... Um, went over to the, the USGS bird banding laboratory, and I asked them for every single instance of a sawwet owl ever getting banded ever. And they said, here's an Excel spreadsheet of 200,000 rows. And I said, great, that looks like a thesis project to me. Um, and, uh, and so then I tried to make sense of it. And from that mess, what I, took, what I, I isolated all of the owls that had been, there's plenty of those were banded once, and that's the last anyone ever saw that owl, right? That's, that's the, that's, the odds are that's what's gonna happen. But there's a small percentage that are banded again. So I isolated those birds, and I drew a line between where it was banded and where it was recaptured. And this is what that map looks like. So you can see that owls are moving all over the place. You can also see where some of the larger research stations are um, that are actually doing the banding, right? So it's not that all of the owls hang, up, hang out over here by McGill. It just happens to be that uh, that's where you know, a big research station is. Um, but anyway, you get the sense of, of how they're moving around. And, but that, that kind of is hard to interpret. It just looks like a box of spaghetti that you dropped on the table, right? Um, and so we started asking questions of this to try to figure out, well, how are these owls actually moving? The whole reason we're doing this research in the first place is because this is an owl that everybody thought up until not too long ago, up until maybe 30 years ago, people thought was extremely rare. 
right? Because whoever sees these, like it's, they're so, they're so um, unlikely to encounter, even though they're common in the woods at the right time of year, you just never encounter them. And so we thought they were in, endangered and there was a motion towards actually listing them as endangered species. But then um, in reviewing some old records and reports, somebody noticed that back in like 1906, there was a case of somebody noticing like 25 or something Sawat owls washed up along the shores of Lake Superior on one beach. And so the researcher thought, well, if they're that rare, how could you end up with 25 of them on one beach in one night? And uh, realized that, well, maybe they're not as rare as we thought. Maybe we're just not looking in the right way. And so this, these research stations popped up. And we started asking just these really basic questions about the biology of this bird. Where does it live? What does it do? Where is it going? And why is it going there? And how does it get back and forth? And so um, just using this banding data, we can start to ask those questions. Now, making this a little bit more relevant to, to the Nature Center, um, these are, this is that, that, this same map, but only extracted so that we're seeing the birds that have been banded and recaptured just right here um, in, in Montpelier. So each one of these lines is a bird that was either banded at North Branch and recaptured somewhere else, or banded somewhere else and recaptured at the Nature Center. So you can see that these birds are getting around. Now I should also mention that these birds are not necessarily banded and recaptured in the same year. And so it might be that a bird is banded in 2017 in one spot and recaptured in 2018 somewhere else. So like the Stevens Point Wisconsin bird did not fly 2,000 miles west um, from here to there. It was moving south, probably wintered down here, and then migrated back up north to nest somewhere up here and then came down on its fall migration and then got caught. So we're kind of catching it at two different, on two different years. Right? But for the most part, you can kind of make out that this is an outlier compared to this stuff. See that? Um, so we tried to quantify that a little bit and look at, well, how are these owls moving? Oh, yeah, there's a, this is an owl in a tomato paste can. Why not? Okay. So we started asking some questions about this banding data. The first one we asked is, all right, when do they actually migrate? Um, we go looking for them in October, but how does that, what does that look like across all of the eastern seaboard? So what we did was we basically took, we made this ladder um, across the whole east coast. And um, each one of these bars is like two degrees latitude. And we looked at how many birds were banded within each one of these rungs of the ladder. Right? And each one of these dots here is basically a banding station. And the larger the dot, the more birds are caught at that banding station. And what we did is we looked at the average day of the year that birds were banded um, in that rung of the ladder. And this is what we got. Where the banders that are working up north, they're getting their peak migration. So like, you know, if you imagine migration as being this bell curve of, of activity of birds moving through a region, the peak of that bell curve is around October 1st um, up in southern Canada. And it's hitting us in about uh, mid-October, October 15th or so, which is why we do all of our northern sawwood owl public banding demonstrations on that week um, at the Nature Center, because we have the highest likelihood of catching a bunch. And they continue moving south. And by the time they get down to southern New York, you know, it's late October. And then down here in November, and, and the birds that do make it all the way down into, many of them just stop, stop here, right? But those that are banded way down here aren't showing up there until mid-November or even early December. So just the simple analysis of this banding data is able to give us information like this that actually shows the front of that migration as it moves across the country. Okay, and then we had another kind of basic bird biology question that we asked. Do males and females migrate differently? So, Take red-winged blackbirds, right? When do we see red-winged blackbirds show up back in Vermont? March. March. And do we, when do we see the female red-winged blackbirds show back up? Later. Later. They're, they're wise, and they know that if they show up in the females, if they show up in March, then they're going to get hit with a snowstorm. <laughs> um, and there's not going to be any food to eat. Um, there's, there's no insects to eat in, in March, um, for the most part, in, in our marshes. Um, and so the males all migrate back, and they stake out territories, and then they wait for the females to arrive back at a more sensible time, right? Um, 
And so there's this differential migration between male and female red-winged blackbirds. And this is true of a lot of different um, species of birds. And we wanted to know, are owls doing this? Are these sawan owls doing the same thing? Right? These sawan owls are uh, they're cavity nesters again, right? But the male will go and find cavities. And then when the female shows up in the territory, the male will escort her around saying, hey, how about this hole? How about that cavity? Like, that, oh, do you like this one? And, uh, and they'll, together they'll pick a cavity to nest in, that sort of thing. So, so territory matters, territory quality matters. And we wanted to know if that was borne out in, in how the males and females are migrating. So we took the, all that banding information and used that latitude ladder again. And we looked, what we looked at was the male to female ratio of birds caught um, on average at each one of these latitude bars. And without getting into it, into like the way into the weeds here, just know that um, most of the birds that we kept, capture are females across the board. Um, we, we, it's rare, somewhat rare to, to capture a male. Um, maybe at the Nature Center last year of the 160 birds that we caught, um, there was maybe just a handful that were definitively males, right? The, and, and it's true across everywhere that you're always going to catch more females at the stations. But the bluer the band, um, the darker the blue, the higher proportion of males. And so um, this is like 0.3 to 1. So like, what, three, three, uh, three males for every 10 females up here at, um, up in Canada, whereas down here we're looking at two or one and a half um, uh, males for every 10 females down here. And you know, this bar here is just kind of weird outlier, I don't know. But, um, but you know, you look at the same information on, on a good old XY graph, and what you see is that the higher the latitude you are, the more likely you are to capture more males. And so we think, okay, well, that's awesome. So the males, perhaps, aren't migrating as far south as the females. They're sticking farther north so that when it's time to migrate back to hold down territory in the spring, they don't have to go as far, right? If a male goes way down here um, to winter and expects to make it up and claim the best possible territory way up in Lake Superior the next spring, it has a long way to go. And by the time it gets there, it's going to be way behind the eight ball, right? Um, and so it's neat that uh, this, this data here uh, bears out that, that these males are actually moving differently than the females. Um, this is just kind of showing similar information in a different way of male to female ratio across space using some fancy GIS analysis. Um, what we also did was we asked the same question of adults and juveniles. So our, do we capture the same ratio of adults to juveniles at the, at the banding stations? Um, and what we discovered is that there is a lot of variation in how many juveniles proportionally are caught at all these different banding stations. And we've decided that we cannot figure out heads or tails about why that is. And we cannot figure out the pattern of this. But, um, but it does seem like there is some differential movement between adults and juveniles, so that's kind of, kind of neat. So this is a really cool question that we try to ask also using this information. Remember that box of spaghetti diagram? We try to make sense of those lines of where birds are banded and where they're recaptured to figure out, are these sawats, are they following the same migration routes from year after year? Or are they coming down one place one year, then going up in a different direction and coming down somewhere else? Are they, are, they, are they holding to a particular migration route? So what we did is we looked at, in terms of a compass rose, the direction that that, that piece of spaghetti was pointing. And the longer the, the line, the, the higher proportion. So we're seeing that, OK, there, there's a general trend of their movement in that direction. That's not, that's not terribly surprising, but it was a fun graph to make. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so then we, we, we try to get at this question of, you know, are they using the same migration routes by doing this? So imagine uh, we're up, this owl here is up in um, Canada, and then down here is like, you know, the Carolinas, okay? So year one, um, fall comes, the owl migrates, and it comes down this particular direction here, and it gets caught at a banding station at 40 degrees latitude over here in, uh, let's say, like Pennsylvania, all right? And then it continues on its way, winter's here, comes back up. The next year, it comes down from Canada, and it gets caught around that same 40 degrees latitude, but it gets caught over in New Jersey instead of Pennsylvania, right? 
And so our question was, if a bird is banded and recaptured at the same latitude in different years, how, what's, what's the average amount of space between the two points, right? So if a bird is banded and recaptured on that same rung of the ladder in different years, is it recaptured uh, very close to where it was banded, or is it captured way far away? And, uh, and this is the, the incomprehensible graph of that. Um, but this, this is the thing that makes more sense, um, which is uh, this is the percent of all the birds that are banded and recaptured, and this is the distance on the bottom here between where the bird was banded and where the bird was recaptured in kilometers. So in other words, 30% of the birds are, are recaptured within 20 kilometers of where they were originally banded. 70% of the birds were banded within 50 kilometers. 80% within 100 kilometers, and almost all of them within 300 kilometers. So, and I, so I put these words up here just for a, a reference. So 20 kilometers is the difference, distance between Waterbury and Montpelier. Uh, 50 kilometers is between Burlington and Montpelier. So you're, uh, this is a bird that's moving potentially from northern Canada to South Carolina, and um, odds are very, very high that it's going to follow a, you know, a migratory corridor that is you know, only at most the width of, um, you know, Montpelier to what I say, Burlington to Montpelier, right? So we say, okay, isn't that neat? The, uh, these birds are, are following the same migration corridors from year to year. That's fun when you look at an actual data point, or like at massive data, but it's even more fun when you have anecdotal evidence of a bird that you actually caught. This year at the Nature Center, we recaptured this bird um, that was, I think it was 11043495 was its name. <laughs> and uh, we recaptured it in 2019. It was recaptured at our banding station the same week of 2018, and it was banded at our station that same week of 2017. Right? Um, yeah. Um, this is, whoops, uh, this is just showing a couple graphs of just the total number of owls that we ban on a, on a given night. We put this in, we made these graphs mostly just, just to have some fun, not particularly because they're that useful, but, um, but showing our total captures per year. So in our first year, we caught 60 birds, 120 the next year, 140, boom, down to 20 birds in 2016. See how that just, there's a peak and there's a drop off. Right? This is, there's a four year, four or five year annual cycle of the Sawa and owl population. Um, about every four years there's a big boom, and then the next year there's a big bust. Um, and that's reflected in the banding activity that we see at all of our stations. What would contribute to the boom and the bust of the Sawa and owl population? The red vole population. The red vole population, yeah, okay, great. Um, so that's fine, but what is, so, Okay, so that you're on to the next piece, yeah. So why does the vole population go up and down then? Food source. The food source, and, and what's actually happening is there's a four to five year um, cycle of the cone crops of the spruce and fir trees in Canada in the boreal forests. And so when there's a big boom year when, and all the, the trees are, are, are fruiting, are in, have, have their cones, then that makes for a really big rodent population. Mm. And so when there's a big rodent population, there's a lot of baby owls that can survive and make it because there's food everywhere. And then the, ne by, and then the next year, um, that food is all consumed. A lot of those young birds die. The, the rodent population has crashed because of the abundance of predators. It's like the classic, like if you remember the lynx and snowshoe hare oscillation graph from, from you know, biology textbooks, it's like that, but it's with owls and, and voles and, and uh, tree cones. But anyway, so we definitely see that more now here too. Um, you can see just some ideas of how many owls we catch on a night. So, you know, on a single night at the nature center, it's really common to catch, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten owls. We often have nights if the wind is just right, if the weather is just right, that we can catch 25, 27. I think our, our record is 56 birds. Not, oh, our record at the nature center is like 27 birds, and the record um, down in New York at a station I worked at was like 56 birds in a single night. And kind of one of the final things that, that we looked at that was kind of interesting is the simple question of how long do these birds live, right? How old can solid owls get? And so we just looked at how, on, on average, um, how many years is it between when the bird is banded and when the bird is recaptured, right? Um, and, and what we see is this kind of age spectrum where um, 
you know, 17 of the recaptured birds are abandoned and recovered in the same year. 37% of them are one year later, 25% two years later, 12% three years later, 6% four years later, 2% five years later. So you're starting to see that, you know, a bird that is one, two, or three years old is pretty common, but it's harder and harder and harder to find a bird that is four, five, six, seven years old. The record is an 11 year old bird in the wild, but. Um, but so anyways, this, this, this kind of banding recapture information is able to paint a picture of just how long these birds live in the wild, right? How did you date their age? Oh, thank you, yeah. So, um, so Ruth asked, how do you age these birds in the first place? Well, um, I don't know if it'll show up on the barred owl wings, um, but we could look at it later if, if once we do have the lights back on, maybe. Um, but the owls, they molt their flight, all birds molt their feathers, right? And, but they don't molt them randomly. They molt them in predictable ways. And they molt feather tracks kind of all at once. Now their flight feathers, they molt from the, essentially from the, I think it's the inside out. Um, and it's synchronous. And so if they lose a feather here, they will also leave that same feather there on that side. And so if you ever look up in the sky and you see a vulture flying around that looks like it has two symmetrical holes in its wings, that's because it's in the middle of its molt and that's how far it's gotten on its molt so far. Um, and if you were able to keep watching that vulture, you'd see those, that gap get progressively farther and farther out. Um, so most birds, especially songbirds, are able to get through their whole wing molt in one year. And, and, and that's just kind of how they evolved to, to molt their feathers. They just do it all in one year pretty quickly in se sequence. Solid owls, they take um, more than two years to finish that whole sequence. And so if we catch a bird, and all of the feathers look exactly the same, then we know it hasn't even begun its molt. So we know it's a juvenile bird. It was born that spring. If we catch a bird where um, we can see that half of the feathers look new and the other ones look old, then we know that's a bird that has started but hasn't completed its molt. And so that's a one-year-old bird. If we catch or ca capture a bird that has um, a gradation between like new feathers, old feathers, new feathers, old feathers, and that's a bird that has um, made it through most of its first molt and is even starting again on the second molt, on a second round of molt, and so that's a two-year-old bird. And you can, with some scrutiny, tell a three-year-old bird, and, but that's about as much as you can get. So some birds we can just tell their age, at least zero, one, or two. After that, um, then when we recapture a bird, um, we can go and ask the bander how old it was when they captured it. So even if we capture a bird and we have no idea how old it is, if the bander said, oh, we banded that six years ago and its wing pattern was that of a second year bird, then we know, okay, well, you have two to six and that's an eight year old bird. Um, we have not caught an eight year old bird, but you get the idea. Um, so anyway, you can use molts to be able to age the bird. We can use the, um, the size of the bird, how much it weighs, to be able to tell whether it's male or female. That's why there was an owl in the tomato paste can upside down, not just for fun, but we put them in there to weigh them on the scale. Um, so that's why we have that tool um, <laughs> uh, is to weigh them. So we use a combination of their weight and their, and their wing length to be able to tell how old they are, or whether they're male or female, I should say. OK, cool. So um, that's, that's kind of where I want to stop, because I want to leave some time for you all to ask any, any owl-related questions you might have. Um, so we can pop the lights back on. And thank you all for listening to me talk about owls. <laughs> The question is, why do the owls come to our, our call when we're broadcasting for them? And that's a question that we don't have a good definitive answer for, but we have a lot of suspicions. One is um, that they're just curious, right? They're, they're, they're migrating through, and they hear a territorial call of their own species, and they got nothing better to do, so they just come down to check out what's going on. Um, it could also be more that it doesn't matter what time of year it is, female owls will be drawn to that sound because it is the territorial sound of that bird. It's, it's that, that sound is used for uh, males to be able to advertise their territory, and, and males will use that to defend their territory. And so it could just be an instinctual thing of like, you hear that sound, you go check it out. It happens to be at the wrong time of year, but maybe it, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, because you don't hear that sound from the birds themselves in the fall. They're not making those noises. Why? Well. 
if you're a tiny little bird and you're making this, this racket in the woods, that's a great way to get found by a barred owl. So it doesn't benefit the, the males, or it doesn't benefit an owl to make noise if it doesn't need to, especially if it's small. Um, so it could be that they're always wired to listen to the sound, but they're only wired to make the sound when it benefits them, right? Um, one of the questions that we have about these, this sound also is, um, generally in nature, there's almost always a 50-50 sex ratio of male to female. And something really weird has to happen with the evolution of, their, um, of that species and, and its um, behaviors to end up with a sex ratio that's not 50-50. And so it's just, it's generally fine to assume that in reality, the, fit, the ratio of male to female solid owls is probably 50-50. And so why do we get so many females and not males then? So our two thoughts for this are, one is that the males don't well, part of what we know is that the males aren't migrating as far south, right? They're sticking farther north. So that accounts for some of it. But even up there, it's still female biased in a big way. And so we think, OK, maybe the females are particularly drawn to this because they're attracted to this really loud male sawwet sound. Um, and it could also be that the, the males are actually um, frightened by this or are, are repelled by the sound because they're listening to the sound of an owl that is louder than any other Sawa owl they've ever heard. It is the meanest, biggest, baddest Sawa owl they've ever, they've ever come across. And so it could be male avoidance, and it could also be female preference. Um, but together, that ends up giving us mostly female owls at the net. So that's a territorial call that you use? Yeah, it's a territorial. It's, so the same, the same call, like, like songs with other birds, it's, it serves multiple functions. You know, the, the bird song um, will at the same time advertise territory um, to females, and it will also advertise to defend that territory against males. Um, yeah. Um, do they mate for life? That's, I don't think we have an answer to that question, actually. Um, many long-lived birds do mate for life. Um, or mostly mate for life. Um, you know, we have great records of eagles and ospreys and this sort of thing, nesting. And puffins actually have, uh, you know, there's the uh, National Audubon Society's Project Puffin always does this, this big like press release on Valentine's Day about their puffin pairs because it'll be like, oh yes, like these two puffins have been raising chicks together for 45 years or something like that. Um, and. Uh, and so, so many birds do mate for life, but with these little, and many owls do too, but we just, I don't think we know yet about the little saw owls. Yeah. How often have you had to discontinue the call because you're drawing into predator owls eating right off the net? Yeah, so we, we, the question was, do we ever have to stop our, our station because there's a barred owl that's at the nets? And we, our, our goal is to stop the station before the barred owl gets to the saw owl. Um, and so fortunately, the barred owls announced that since they're big, they have, they, it doesn't matter if they make, they can make noise whenever they want. Nothing's going to eat them, right? And so uh, they're not as, as quiet as the small sawets. And so if, if barred owls are in the area, they're usually very vocal. And so we'll, we can hear from the nature center if there's a barred owl calling in the woods. And, um, and we'll do much more regular net checks to go down there every 15 minutes and, and try to figure out how close that owl is. And if the owl doesn't move off, then, then we'll close the nets for the night. Um, also, sometimes we catch the barred owl in the net. And that's a great deterrent against catching barred owls in the net. You know, if you, um, if you, catch, the, if you catch an owl in the net, it, it generally isn't going to want to go to that area again. And it's not going to find the sound of a sawat owl all that appetizing anymore. Um, and so we actually sometimes try to encourage the owl into the net so that we can, we can band it and let it go so that it's had that experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of birds are decreasing in numbers, and some species are going extinct. What's the status of them? Yeah. So the question was about uh, species decline and, and just general population decline, and a lot of bird species. And, and uh, many of you may have seen the New York Times uh, article that was referencing lots of studies showing that there's about a third less birds in the woods now than there were 30 years ago. And, and you know, we, we hear um, different examples of this sort of, sort of stuff um, way too frequently. Um, breaking that down a little bit, looking at, well, who are we missing in the woods? Um, species that migrate long, long distances to faraway places um, are, so like warblers and flycatchers and things like that, those swallows, you know, those are the types of species that we're seeing Definitely seeing a lot fewer of those. 
um, because you know you can do all you want with habitat conservation, you know, up in the breeding grounds, and we all know how difficult that is to begin with. Well, who knows what's possible in terms of habitat conservation on their wintering grounds, right? So they have all these added pressures, these migratory birds, of having to not only find a good suitable habitat here, but also do the same thing down in, you know, Haiti or Yucatan or something like that, right? And uh, and so and then they have to actually get back and forth, which requires a lot of luck and a lot of food along the way and all this. Um, generally speaking, uh, species of birds that, that spend their whole life in one place here, like all of our feeder birds, for instance, you know, they're, they're not, they're doing just fine, right? They're able to find all the food they need. They're able to, they're not making these, these big treks. And as far as we can tell, solid owls fall in the latter category where, you know, they are um, really common resident birds that don't, they're not very specialized. They don't really need very much to be happy. They need a tree cavity in the woods and some mice to eat, and that's good. And that's all they need. And, um, and so as far as we can tell, Sawat owl populations are very stable. And, um, and I would wager that owl, at least the owls that we have in Vermont, owl populations in general in Vermont are pretty stable. Saw wet. What the heck does that mean? Saw wet. So S-A-W hyphen W-H-E-T. <laughs> Apparently, when you sharpen a saw on a whetstone, it goes do 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 do. <laughs> right, and so it's supposed to be the sound of the the sound of the bird is supposed to be the sound of the whetstone, because the, the you can't call it the the truck backing up owl. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I actually have two questions. One, what information do you get from the DNA besides the sex? And the second question is, I had the occasion, fortunately, to dissect owl pellets. Mm. Do all owls produce pellets? So um, the, I'll start with the second question. Do all owls make pellets? And I believe all the owls that we have here do make pellets, right? So they eat whatever rodent or bird that they've snacked on for dinner. And, um, and birds have a, you know additional organ called a gizzard, right? That, um, that is kind of like a way to crunch and process food before it reaches the stomach. And so, um, so um, that's why owls make pellets, is they've partially digested a bunch of stuff, and they just regurgitate the bones and the feathers and the hair out of that so it doesn't pass all the way through their system and, and you know, complicate the, the works there. Uh, your first question was about DNA and what information do we get out of the DNA in addition to the sex of the bird. And, and really for our purposes all we were trying to get at was the sex of the bird. We do have a system that we can use to measure the wing length of the bird and the weight of the bird and that combination of those two can tell us if it's a male or a female. Um, so if it's really big it's a female, if it's really small it's a male. But there's a lot of overlap in there and one of the studies that, that we did um, was looking at that, the nature of that overlap. There's a lot of birds that we just have to call unknown because they fall in the middle. And so we just kind of, as researchers generally, we've just been writing off these owls, owls, unknown, unknown, unknown. And so we actually did the DNA analysis to go back and look at those, unknown, those birds that were labeled unknown by the morphometric analysis and say, well, were they male or female definitively? And what we found is that if you are put into the unknown category, it is much more likely that it was a male that you couldn't categorize than it was a female that you couldn't categorize. And so part of the reason for this, this uh, difference in, in uh, proportion of sexes at the banding station um, is a little exaggerated because if it's an unknown bird, it is actually, um, there's a higher likelihood of it being male than female. And so it's actually we're under-reporting the males unless we have DNA evidence to conclusively say it. But most people don't collect DNA because it's a little bit more invasive on the birds. Yeah. Any other questions over here? Yeah. Quick question. Um, you're using metal, presumably, on the banding. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue with one bird eats another? What's the metal band? You know, what kind of metal? Oh, yeah. So the, the bands are made of aluminum. Um, and the bands are always small, and they're sized for that size of bird. Um, and uh, I've never been asked the question about what happens if something eats that bird, what happens to the band. And the band actually just passes right through whatever predator ate it. And um, you, know, you figure like these birds are eating bones and things like that. And so the, the bands do pass through. I'm not sure that, that, I've never heard of any complications of a predator eating a banded bird. Because you'll find, um, you know, 
Like you, you find like Canada geese bands in a pile of feathers, you know, on the side of a river sometimes from where like an eagle ate it. And, and so you, you do see that sometimes. And some of the, a lot of the bands that are actually reported, not of sawwets, but of other birds, bands that are reported are bands that are picked out of a pile of feathers or, you know, a pile of scat or something like that, or a pellet, yeah. There's a question over here, yes. Do you want to know if you find a band? Yes, yes. So if you ever do find a bird band, you can report it. And you can actually go, uh, there is a whole, there's a portal online where if you find any bird of any species, any, any bird band of any species, you can um, uh, go there. I think it's the, well, it's the USGS Bird Banding Lab. And they make it very easy to find. Um, it's this page where you type in the band number that you found. And if you know anything else about the bird, like if, if you just find the band, then that's all you have. But if you put in the band number, you could put in, oh, this was on a robin. Uh, if you know the species, just to corroborate. But you hit a button and you put in your email address and they'll actually email you a little certificate that says, this is who you reported. It was banded here on this date by this person. It's this species. Um, yeah. So, so one, and so speaking of that, one of the things that we do at the Nature Center is we do an adopt an owl program um, where you can uh, symbolically, you can't take it home, you symbolically adopt an owl. And so um, when we ban the bird, we write down your name next to it and your information. And if that bird is ever recaptured by us or by any other bander in the country, we'll know about it and we will send you a little certificate saying what your owl is up to. Right? Um, so, so it's a, it's a great, makes a great, great little holiday gift and, and, uh, and a good way to support our research too. I have two questions. Um, the first is about the migration and the iconic image of migration is peace at the bee. I don't think that the Sawwet Owls do that, but do they travel as a group? And how does this actually work? Oh, that's, that's such an interesting question. So the question is, do, are, are these owls migrating alone or together? Exactly. So you read any textbook, you talk to anybody, and they'll say, oh yeah, these owls travel alone. Why would they travel together? They're not pack hunters. They're, they have no reason to be traveling together, right? Um, but I tell you, sometimes on, a, on a, you know, like a, a night at the nature center, we'll be sitting there and, and we check the nets every 45 minutes to an hour. Um, we go down and see what we've caught. And I tell you, sometimes we'll go down and we'll have nothing, 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 nothing. Like five hours will go by, no birds. And then the next check will be three birds right next to each other in the same net. And tell me those birds weren't moving together, right? Um, I wish there was a way to quantify that. Um, so now it's just a fun mystery. But I, I suspect that they are actually moving together. Whether they're family groups of you know, adults and juvenile birds, um, I don't know. Um, Has anybody ever seen them? No, nobody's seen them. So when they, and when they do migrate, they're not up in the sky flying like a goose. They're just leapfrogging from tree to tree. You know, slowly working their way south as the weather allows. So remember that 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 map of all the, the rainbow colors. Like it takes them two whole weeks to wander their way from you know from the north part of Vermont to the south part of Vermont, right? So they're not going very fast. They're just moving opportunistically, working their way slowly south. So, yeah. How often do they need to eat? They eat a, about a mouse a night. Yep, or a vole a night, I should say. Yep. Yeah. How old do the barred owls live? How long do they live to be found? Um, I'm taking a, the question was how old do barred owls live? And I'm going to take a guess here because I don't know definitively, but I would, I would guess with some reasonable measure of accuracy that they could live between 15 and 20 years. <laughs> what's, what's the nursing behavior between, well, with, with uh, females and males? Mm -hmm. So with owls, um, it, it, so uh, how involved the male and the female are in, in raising young totally depends on the species. Um, with owls, the male and the female are both providing, I'm trying to actually remember now, with, with sawwets, if, if, so the female incubates, the male provides food. What I can't remember is if the male also incubates and the female also provides food if they trade off both duties or if it's, if it's the male providing mice and, the, and also once the, um, once the young are old enough to be able to thermoregulate on their own, they don't need to be sat on anymore and so both parents will, will be doing food runs constantly. We see that a lot in uh, songbirds, well all birds too, where you know, one parent might be tight to the nest or they might share the duty of, um, of incubating 
and thermoregulating the chicks, but once they're old enough um, and they're a little bit larger, then both parents will be feeding the, feeding the chicks. So with, with the sawwat owls, what that looks like is every once in a while, a vole is dropped into the, um, into the cavity, <laughs> um, and then you know, the chicks tear it apart. Or the parents will break the vole into pieces and feed it to the chicks. Mm -hmm. Is there one more question? Uh, one more question. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, a slide there with five or six little eggs in there. How many of those uh, chicks will survive? Hmm, that's a good question. So how many chicks will survive from the eggs that are laid? Um, and that's another question that I don't know that we have great information on um, because it's really hard to study that stuff because you need... Uh, solid owls don't like nest boxes very much. Um, we put up 100 nest boxes in New Paltz. We had zero solid owls using any of them, even though it was a spot where we caught you know, 50 plus uh, in a single night. Um, so, uh, so the data is limited there, but it also depends on how many rodents are available to be feeding the chicks, right? Um, but it would be totally reasonable for of all those eggs for there to be three or four young that, that survive to, to mature, uh, survive to kind of fledging independence. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.